open your Bible to Second Tim, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter three. Does God send people to hell? You hear that at times, uh, people who are uh, unbelievers, people who are atheists, people who are agnostics. Many people will say something to the effect of, uh, I cannot believe in a God. I'm an atheist because I can't believe in a God who sends people to hell. Well, we are covering that issue today from a biblical perspective. Uh, this is a question that comes up regularly. We've touched on it before, but I wanted to spend some more focus time on it today. It is a very serious issue. It is a very serious issue. It deals with the most important issue that there is in life, of course, because depending on what you do with the truth that we will look at today will really uh, affect your eternity and where you're going to spend eternity. Maybe you're somebody who you've got questions and you don't understand. Well, hopefully you'll get your answers today and you'll end up understanding what Christ has done for you and how God sees you and how much he loves you and what he wants to give you, which is a home in heaven, as a gift, and that you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. We see the nature of God in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. People ask sometimes, why doesn't God step in and do something with all the corruption and evil that is in the world today? Because he's being long-suffering, that is why. Because he's waiting until a further time, because he wants more people to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior before he begins this horrific time on the earth called the Tribulation Period, seven years of unprecedented destruction and testing, and trial, and judgment. That's coming. And so the Bible says God is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. It is not God's will that any would be lost, or that any would end up in hell, but that all should come to repentance. Of course, the word repentance means a change of mind, okay? You understand, you, you see your need that you are lost, you are guilty, you are a condemned sinner. You understand you can't save yourself. And then you understand God so loved you, he sent his son to die in your place to pay your sin debt. And that he did that and he rose from the grave. And you understand that all you need to do is trust in him as your savior and God will give you everlasting life as a gift, this is the message of the Bible. This is the heartbeat of God. And by the way, this is the whole reason Jesus came into the world was to provide salvation for lost mankind. So keep that in mind. Does God send people to hell? Well, the short answer is no. No, God does not send people to hell. Let me say it again. God does not send people to hell. People want to make these false accusations against God without understanding or being open to the real facts. Man ends up being separated from God for all eternity because he rejects God's plan of salvation. It is his choice. It is his choice. God created us as beings who have the ability to make choices. Okay? The mess we are in today in this world is because man made the wrong choice. Man sinned. Sin entered the world and death by sin. And so we've got this situation. But once man sinned and death came upon all men, according to Scripture, and death came into the universe and into creation and into mankind, God promised he would send a Redeemer to provide a fix for that, to provide restoration. You might say, how quickly did he do it? Well, man sinned in Genesis 3 and God provided the solution in Genesis 3. How's that? Shows you the heart of God. 
shows you the heart of God. Man ends up being separated from God because of his choice. Some would say, but what if they haven't heard the message? Well, we're going to get to that this morning because that is really part of the issue. So let's look at two major points today, and then there are some sub-points, especially to this first one. The first major point is this. The Bible says that man is without excuse. All right? Now, let that sink in. And we're going to look at it, and we just read it this morning when we opened, but we're going to look at that in detail in a few minutes. I want you to let that sink in, though, to your minds this morning. Man is without excuse. In other words, dear friend, understand this. When a person stands before God at the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment for the lost at the end of time, he will be without excuse. In other words, there will be no excuse for his lost condition at that point. No excuse for that. Yeah, well, what about no? No excuse, according to the Bible, and we'll see why this morning. But look with me to Psalm 19. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 19. Why is man without excuse? Well, let's start looking at some reasons. Number one, he's without excuse because of the witness of creation. He's without excuse because of the witness of creation. In Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. You notice the heavens, the universe is shouting the glory of God. You look around and that is what's going on. God is saying, I am here. I am God. There is none other. I am God Almighty. When you look at creation, that is the message that's coming out. I am God. There is no other. I am the great creator. You are accountable to me. This is a witness of the reality and the existence of God. Creation is. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. Isn't that an interesting term? As every day goes by, God is communicating with man. I am here. I am God, and you are not. Okay? Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Do you see verse 3? You know, we want to talk, think about, well, what about that uh, primitive, quote-unquote, primitive man in the jungle, in the Amazon? Guess what? God is speaking through creation. God is speaking. There is a universal witness going on by God himself through the creation 24-7 as time goes on. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It means everywhere people are hearing it. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, which is where our scripture reading was today. I'm going to look at many scriptures, so please do follow along. Hopefully you brought your Bible with you. If you didn't, we'll be projecting the verses up on the screen here. Romans chapter 1, it says this in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word hold there means to hold down, to suppress it. Okay, Man is trying to suppress the truth of God down. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You notice, God has already showed it to man. Now watch this. For the invisible things of him. People say, I believe in God if I could see him. Well, you can see the evidence of him. He's a spirit. You can't see spirit. And by the way, he did give us a break when Jesus was here. Because Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. 
And Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Do you see that? From the creation of the world since the beginning of time are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is the witness of creation, the world in which we live. Folks, it is a, it is a um, pathetic and I don't say that in a condescending way. I'm, I'm trying to find the right word. It is a pathetic situation we have when a, when a human being can look at the world around them and see the magnificence of design in creation. You even look at something as simple as a daisy and you see the geometry of the shape of that. And in all that is around us, the magnificence of God's creation, and for people to look at that and say, I don't believe there is a God. Where did the design come from? It didn't just happen. It takes more faith to believe it just happened than to believe there was a maker, a creator of these things. No, God is witnessing to us. He says, I am there. You have an accountability to me. I am speaking to you, and there is not a place in the world, regardless of who it is, that is not hearing, or let me put it this way, that the sound is not heard, or that the sound is not available. Whether people are listening to, or not, that's up to them. But you notice in verse 20, that's a powerful, powerful four words there at the end of the verse. They are without excuse. Let that sink in without excuse. Friend, when you stand before God, if you don't trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you stand before God, you will be able to utter nothing that will be of value that will change your destiny. You will be without excuse. Without excuse. Psalm 14, Psalm 14. Now we'll be back to Romans, by the way. But in Psalm 14, it says in verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Now look at what God says about the one who says that. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. You see, man has rejected the truth of God. It isn't that the truth isn't there. It is that man has rejected it. That is why he's without excuse. Because he did not want to be accountable to God, he came up with something such as the false theory of evolution. Okay? Make no mistake about it. Darwinian evolution, if it is true, the Bible is not true. All right? There is no marriage. There is no compromise. If Darwinian evolution is true, the Bible is not true. And if the Bible is true, evolution is not true. The two do not go together. They cannot be married. That many times leads a person, if they believe in Darwinian evolution, that many times leads them to a point where they say, well, God must not exist. Okay? Why would you say that? Well, because evolution is true. The Bible says God created everything. That can't be true if evolution is true. Therefore, God is not who he said he is, therefore God must not be real. The Bible's not true. I reject it. This is where man finds himself. This is where many people find themselves today. But let me say clearly this morning that atheism is a learned position. Okay? No one comes into this world an atheist. 
might say, why do you say that? Well, let's move on to our second reason man is without excuse. He's without excuse because of conscience. Remember, there's the witness of creation. God is speaking. Children grow up and they marvel at the world in which they live. They're amazed by it. But man is without excuse because of conscience. Back to Romans chapter 2. It says in verse 14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. Do you see it? And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Now you're in chapter 2. Jump back to chapter 1. In verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And look at this. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. It's kind of like evolution in reverse there, isn't it, in verse 23? Folks, listen, this is why man is in a predicament he is in today. In John chapter 3, verse 19, it says, this is the condemnation, okay? That light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Do you know there are famous evolutionists that have said the reason we believe in evolution, even though it's got its faults, is because basically of their uh, immoral preferences. I'm being discreet this morning. Because they want to cling to their immoral preferences and their immoral lifestyle. Therefore, to do that, they have to reject God. So they reject him. Their foolish hearts are darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Man's wickedness and pride can blind him to the truth. He chooses darkness, though. You understand that? Man chooses darkness because God provides light. But because man chooses darkness, he gets to where he doesn't believe. He gets to where he rejects God. He gets to where in his mind it's easy to reject God. And he seeks out groups that will agree with him. And in his mind temporarily, and I say temporarily because one day he'll stand before God, in his mind temporarily he feels better about his position because he's got other people saying, yes, that's right, yes, that's right, yes, you're right, yes, we stand with you. And they think their strength in numbers. But friend, there are no numbers that can stand before God Almighty. None. Man is without excuse. Let's move on. He is without excuse because God's drawing of men to Christ and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He is without excuse because of God's drawing of men to Christ and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see this. Look with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. These are very important verses because, you know, people, um, people want to accuse God of all these unjust things and talk about him being this, this, this uh, cosmic ogre. Even though they don't believe in him, they talk about him like he exists. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? But what is going on? 
here's what's going on. Regardless of man's rejection of the Lord, regardless of man's rejection of Jesus Christ, here's what's going on behind the scenes. You want to know what's happening? Here's what's happening. Jesus said in John 12, 31, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, he was talking about his crucifixion, when he was suspended between heaven and earth on a cross. He says, and I, if I be lifted from the earth, watch this, will draw all men to me. All. The word all means 100% of all that is. When Jesus died on the cross, okay, the cross work of Jesus Christ, Paul said the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness, okay? The cross representing the gospel, the preaching of the cross. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. All people are being drawn to Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is God who cannot lie. This is what's happening. People are being, are being drawn to Christ. Who? People in America? People in America. People in Europe. People in Africa. People in Antarctica. Everywhere on the planet. Asia. Everywhere. Everyone everywhere is being drawn. You might say, well, then why aren't more people saved? Because of their choices and because of the lies they're being fed that they're embracing. But they are being drawn. Not only that, look at chapter 16 of John. Now, we've already looked at it. Man is without excuse. And I'm giving you reasons today, and the Bible's giving us reasons why man is without excuse. The witness of creation, the witness of conscience, the, the drawing of men to Christ, and also under this, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7, Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove. That means convict the world. Who? The world, not just the United States, the entire planet. But he is working here. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. But you see, folks, while the conviction and the drawing is going on all the time through the cross of Christ, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, through the creation of God, through the conscience that God has given us, Man can resist the drawing of the Lord. But that resistance is a choice. It's a choice. That's why man is without excuse. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I get blown away by the short statements Jesus made that are so weighty and are so heavy, they just knock my socks off. This is one. Look at it, John 5, 40. Look at it. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. It isn't that you can't have life. It isn't that Jesus is not offering life. He says to those resisting, rejecting him, you will not come to me. It's your choice not to come to me. You're resisting. 
what I want to give you. Let's move on. He's without excuse because God will get the message to him if he wants it. All right? What about the man in Africa? Uh, you, you hear that one. What about the man in Africa? Well, I got a question for you. What about the man in America? Did you know that Africa was reached with the gospel before America was? It's true. Don't worry about how God will get someone the gospel. He said he will do it, and we have the proof in Scripture on how he does it. And I want to give you two examples of that today. Instead of me just saying it, I want you to see it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Two marvelous, marvelous examples of this. God, a man is without excuse because God will get the message to him if he wants it. If he wants it. Acts chapter 8. The story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Here in uh, Acts chapter 8, it says in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. That was, that was quite a stretch, which is desert. Jump down to verse 30. And of course, what was it? There was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was in his chariot. And he just happened to be reading Isaiah. And he just happened to be reading Isaiah 53, which is the greatest messianic chapter in the book of Isaiah. You can read Isaiah 53 and you know it's talking about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. It says in verse 30, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, or Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Jump, jump down to verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Here is a man with part of Isaiah. He's reading Isaiah 53. Why in the world is he reading Isaiah 53? I'll tell you why. Because he's being drawn by God. That's why. Because God's working in his life. And because God just, he, this man wanted truth. He didn't know what it was, but he wanted the truth. And God says, I will get, I will get it to you if you want it. And that's exactly what he did. And he sent Philip many miles to go talk to this guy. He was out in the middle of the desert. Now, if God can do that in Acts chapter 8, can't he do that today? Yes, he can do that today. He does it today. And there's testimony after testimony, miraculous ways God has gotten a message to people. See, folks, man is without excuse let God be God. How's he going to get it there? Don't worry about it. If he created the universe, I think he can get the message to somebody who wants the truth. Let me give you another example. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. I really like Cornelius because he was, he, he was uh, a centurion. He had an Italian band. Capiche? Okay. And don't come up afterwards and ask me what capiche means. I think it means do you understand or do you get it? I don't know that for sure. My mom would sometimes say it. Okay. Do you know how to speak Italian? Very few words in Italian. Very few words. But here in, in, in Acts chapter 10, we know in, in the book of Acts, here's Cornelius, and he prayed... He prayed unto God, and the word pray means, means a, a petition arising out of a sense of need. And, you know, that just sounds pretty generic, doesn't it? But we find out later that the need was salvation. He was responding to the light and the conviction and the drawing in his life. And he was responding, wanting 
to know. And God says, I'm going to get that to him. Now, understand this. He's a Gentile. Peter is a Jew, and he's a very Jewish Jew. And he's saved. And so God had to give Peter a vision, and he gave it to him three times to get it through his head. That he was going to be speaking to a Gentile. Because Jews just didn't do a whole lot of that. But you see the heart of God. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And here we see in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius had prayed that the Lord would bring the truth to him. And the Lord sent Peter almost 40 miles That's from St. Cloud to Rogers, Minnesota. And they didn't have cars. You see the heart of God? The Lord sent Peter almost 40 miles to reach Cornelius with the gospel. Look at Acts chapter 10 in verse 30. So, Peter comes. He was instructed. And he came, he obeyed, and he came to Cornelius in Caesarea, and Cornelius said in verse 30, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Hither Simon, whose surname is Peter, he's lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. How's that for detailed instructions? Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Powerful statement, by the way. We just think in generic terms. This was a real deal with Peter. Because he had a Jewish prejudiceness about him. Okay? Verse 43. Peter concludes... By saying, to him give Jesus, to him give all the prophets witness, referring to Jesus, all the prophets talk about Jesus, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. Cornelius believed. Okay? Think about it, folks. Can God do this? Yes, he can. Can God get the gospel to somebody in a remote place? Yes, he can. And I'll go further. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So, man is without excuse because of God's drawing of men to Christ and the conviction of the Spirit. He's without excuse because God will get the message to him if he wants it. If a man wants the truth, he may not even know what it is, but God knows the heart and he will get him the message. Let's move on. He's without excuse because the Bible tells us the truth. The Bible tells us the truth. In other words, how it really is. Do you see the work of Satan? He is constantly, constantly, since there's that chapter again, Genesis chapter 3, been questioning and trying to get man to doubt the validity of what God has to say. And so this continues, 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 and it's going on today as well. And it's going on today, folks, uh, with, with continual new Bible translations. Why do we just ever, all the time have to have a new one? Why can't somebody get it right, quote unquote? Now, I think they have gotten it right. That's why we use the text that we do. But uh, nevertheless, the point is this. When, when Bibles are continually disagreeing with each other, how do you know what God really said? 
It's a legitimate question. So people question it. And then you've got people who are saved, who have bought into the idea of higher criticism. By the way, shouldn't that right there make alarms go off? We believe in the higher criticism of the Bible. Well, number one, who's higher and why are you criticizing it? Maybe we ought to just believe what it says and trust God. Six days creation. Why not? Is that too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? It says he did it in six days. Why not just simply believe it? Well, no, that's not scholarly. Really? I think Dr. God knows more about it. I think it's kind of interesting in Romans 1, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Don't you think it's funny that the teachers in the universities are called professors? Anyway, sorry, I apologize, but I just think that's interesting. Here's the point. The point, though, folks, is this. Man is without excuse because the Bible tells us the truth. And what that means is that man is personally responsible for how he responds to it. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, that same shall judge him in the last day. You want to know the standard of judgment that will be used against man? When man stands before God, it is this book right here. It is this book. No wonder people are trying to do away with it, change it, pervert it, question it, doubt it, reject it, because they don't want to be accountable. It, God says we are accountable. What you are hearing today is the truth of the matter, and you are responsible to believe what you are hearing. Okay? Which leads us to our second point, and we're shifting. We're kind of, it's the pivot today. God has done all the work necessary for you to go to heaven and keep you out of hell. Okay? Does God send people to hell? No, he does not. God has done all the work necessary for you to go to heaven and keep you out of hell. He offers salvation to hell, or salvation from hell to you, to all of us, as a free gift. Let that sink in. It is a free gift. Eternity in heaven, not eternity in hell, is a free gift. Does that sound like somebody who's sending people to hell? No, it does not. God has done all the work. Imagine, for an example, if you're diagnosed with cancer, and they say, you have a month to live. You're going to die in a month. And so after the initial shock of it, of course, you start investigating and looking for answers to this. And you hear of some man who has come up with an absolute 100% cure for your cancer. And he gets connected with you and he says, I have the cure. Yes, I do. I will let you have it. I will let you have it for, for free. You can have it for free. And if you take my cure... You will be cured for cancer. You'll never die of cancer. And you say, I can't believe it. That's too easy. Certainly there's got to be small print. This is a trick. This is crazy. I can't believe it. This is easy believism. Well, let me tell you something. This is exactly what Jesus has done, has provided for us eternal life as a free gift. Look with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> we see what God has done. Here, is, here it, we see it explained. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why you can't go to heaven. 
because you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Everybody is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But through what Jesus did on the cross, and I'll explain that in detail in just a moment, we are being offered eternal life as a gift. Verse 24, being justified, declared as righteous freely. See, there's no price for us to pay. Freely, by His grace. Grace and free always go together because grace is unmerited, undeserved. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission, the forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Who will He justify? Who will He save? Who does He give eternal life to? The one who puts His faith, who believes in Jesus as a Savior. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified, declared righteous by faith, without the deeds of the law. Simply by faith, without doing good deeds. Because if you have to also do good deeds, then it's not free. It's not by grace. If you have to be good to go to heaven, it's not by grace. If you have to live a faithful life, it's not by grace, because grace is unmerited, undeserved kindness. No, but the Bible's clear, isn't it? For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God is a just and holy God by nature, and His justice must be satisfied. If sin were allowed into heaven, then death would be there as well, and not eternal life. The Lord cannot let a person into heaven until a person's sins are gone, and that person has God's own righteousness. So then how are you going to get that? How, do, how are we going to get it? We have, we have failed. Look, this is sin. This is us. We're sinners. Our sin separates us from God. You can't get to heaven with your sin. You have to be sinless. God says it must be paid for. God is a holy God. Justice must be satisfied. Death must take place for that sin. If you die for your sin, you'll not only die physically, but spend forever separated from God in hell. God says, I love you. I have provided for you the way to heaven to where you don't have to go to hell. As a matter of fact, he says, I, don't, I not only provided it, I'm the one, I am the provision myself. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross, he paid for our sins. He died in our place. He had to be God because we needed a perfect substitute. He had to be man because man needed another man to die in his place. Enter the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one ever. Fully God, perfect man. He went to the cross. He died in our place. He was buried. He rose from the grave. And he says, if you believe in me, trust in me, that I made that payment for you, you will not perish. You will have everlasting life, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world for God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sends no one to hell. Man chooses to reject what God has provided for him. And he ends up in hell by choice by choice. So here's the conclusion. God sends no one to hell. Man chooses hell for himself when he rejects God's plan of salvation. 
which offers to him eternal life as a free gift. It is a free gift bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. Yes, a payment had to be made for our sins, but Jesus did it, and he offers us eternal life as a free gift. What more can he do than that? That is why if a man dies without Christ, he has no excuse. And when he stands before God, he will have no excuse. Because there are all these witnesses, and there's the drawing and the conviction and everything that goes into it, and the payment has been made. What a wonderful Savior we have. And friend, he can be your Savior if you'll trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're not making any promises to him You're saying, basically, Lord, I understand I am a lost sinner, but I want that gift of eternal life. You're offering it to me. I want it. I don't want to end up in hell. I want to go to heaven. And will you trust Christ today as your Savior, friend? Would you do that? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, with every head bowed and please every eye closed and no one looking around, and if you happen to be watching today over the internet, or if this is a, you may be down the road, you'll, you'll see this or hear this message. Whoever you are, friend, here today in this room or away over media, today could be your day of salvation. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Would you trust in him today? as your Savior. You cannot save yourself. You have no reason not to trust in Him. He'll give you everlasting life. Will you trust Him? Right where you sit in the quietness of your mind. You know, God knows your thoughts. Why don't you just talk it over with Him and get it settled? Or the best I know how, I'm trusting in Christ today. I believe He died for me paid for my sins and rose from the grave. I put my faith in him and him only, only as my Savior. Friend, if you'll trust him, he will save you. Please do that. Don't be foolish and reject it. You don't know when you're going to die. And once you die, it's too late to change your mind. Trust in him, would you? Now, if today you've trusted Christ as Savior, I'd love to know that. I won't embarrass you in any way, and you don't have to do this, but I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand to let me know that it made sense to you. I, I want to pray for you, I, not by name, but I'd love to pray for God's direction, blessing in your life. Is there anyone who would say, yes, today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ. Let me say, if you haven't trusted Christ, please, please, friend, don't die. Because if you die without Christ, you'll be lost forever with no second chance. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your loving heart, how your heart breaks when people die without Christ. The payment has been made. The sacrifice has been made. You offered up your very Son, as a payment for our sin. And men still reject you and reject your ways, yet you love us so much. You did all the work, and you offer it freely. Help us, Father, have compassion on the people we meet. Many do not understand, many have not heard, but Lord, there are those who are searching and those who are open. Please lead us to those, Father. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for each one here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit 
www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.